Hello, my name is Patrick Allen, and I am an interviewer for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress in Washington. And the program in Southwest Ohio is through the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library under the direction of Brian Powers. And we have the privilege today of interviewing a, a veteran, Marion Miller. Marion, thank you for doing this interview. Thank you, sir. It's and, a pleasure. <clears throat> we'll, uh, before we start talking about your military career, let's talk about Marion. Uh, you've got a birthday coming up. When were you born? I was born, when was I born? Where, Where was I born? When? When? Uh, when? Dave. Well, I was born to... November? November the, November the 8th, 1923. Right, and you're going to be 100 years old tomorrow. I'll be 100 years old on the 8th of November, which is tomorrow. And we're doing this interview at your home, and that's at 723 Faulkner oh. Avenue in Dayton, Ohio. Exactly. Good. Who do you live here with? I'm here alone. I live alone for the time being. Well, good. You're, you're healthy enough to take care of yourself here at the house. Well, I've been doing pretty good at it so far, sir. Good, good. I think. <laughs> now, when you, when you were born in November, where were you born? I was born in Indian and Old Fields, Kentucky. And were you born in a hospital or in a house? I was born in a house. And whose house were you born in? My mother's sister's house. What was her name? Her name was Eva, E-V-A, -E Eva. My mother's sister, Eva. What she married your... she married a guy named William. Bill William. Bill Williams? Yeah, that was my sister's oh, uh, what was your mother's name? What was your mother's name? My mother's name is Anna. A N N A. And your father Miller. And your father's name was John? My father's uh, who uh, was responsible for the for his... me being here. His name is John, John. Davis. All right. Um when you were born at home, uh, did you have a doctor? Yes. And I think you told you even remember his name. Yes, uh, Doctor Young. Wow, U N G, Doctor Young, Doctor Young, M D, uh -huh. medical doctor. So, how long did you uh, live there in uh, Oldfield, Kentucky? I was there with my mother uh, and my sister, my mother's sister. Probably for about two years. Okay. And then where did you go? Uh, then I left, went to Winchester, Kentucky, and lived with uh, friends of mine, mostly friends of mine. All right. And uh, did you go to school in the Winchester? No, sir. Where did you go to school? I went to school in a little town in Clay City, Kentucky. Clay City. Clay City? Yes, sir. That's Powell County. Uh, what what town is that near? What bigger town is well, that near? Well, it's uh it's a hundred and some twenty two miles from from uh, Hazard, Kentucky, which is one of the largest parts of uh, Kentucky. Kentucky mm -hmm. don't have but two large cities: Louisville and Lexington. Louisville and Lexington, and uh, the rest of them just walk through town. And, and <laughs> Hazard is way down in the southeastern part of the state. That's it. Right. That's in the eastern part of Kentucky, where I was born. Name of two parts: the eastern and the west. Down Paducah way, the did, west, deep did, west. Did you have any brothers and sisters? No, sir. All right. No brothers and sisters. So what, what did your mother do? Did your mother uh, work outside the home? No, I, my mother just took and cooked and did whatever was available for her to bring in. She uh, never worked a day in her life. Okay, did, did she cook for other people? She cooked for other people, me. Okay. Uh, and the family. All right. That's all she did. She might say she so. was just a house worker. What was the name of the uh, elementary school you went to? Pompey. Pompey? We call it Pompey. Uh, that's, in, that's in Clay City, did you Powell go, County. Did you go there all eight years? 
I went there all eight years. How, how, big, how big was your class? Uh, probably about 30, 30, 30 or more. But the numbers vary a little bit. No, but uh, it was a one-room school. I was going to ask you about that one-room school, yeah. and uh, did you have a male teacher or a female teacher? We had all kinds of teachers, all, and I remember them all: um, Channel Lawrence, Ms. Uh, Scott Mitchell, the man, teacher, the man teacher, professor. How but, many? students were in your particular grade with you? Uh, about 15. About 15 children was in that school what, what, uh, with me that uh, graduated in eighth grade at the same of, time that I did. What kind of a building was it? Was it a brick building, a wood no, building? No, no, it was, a, it was just, a, what you might say. Just a wood frame building? Mm, yes. How did you heat the school? Sir? How did they heat the school? Did you have a pot belly stove? We did. You know, I never thought about that. We had a pot belly stove. <laughs> yeah. Sure did. <laughs> and we burnt coal. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, um, that part of Kentucky, coal was pretty plentiful, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yes, it was. So did you have to do anything to start the uh, fire in the morning before class? Well, I did that at home because I'd get up in the morning and start the fire with kindling and pine knots. Okay. If you ever heard the word. Sure. Not, uh, pine knots. And start the fire and things. That was my job. Get up in the morning and start the fire in the fireplace. Okay. At uh, home. Right, right. Um, when you were at home, did you have running water, or did you have a well or a cistern? No, we got the water from the spring. At a spring? We, uh, when I was a little fella, I remember, remember that uh, I'd go to the spring and get the water and, and blow the wiggle tails back out of the way so I'd get the water. <laughs> <laughs> the wiggle tails. The wiggle tails, okay. <laughs> uh, and, um, <laughs> So uh, what kind of a, of a stove or oven did your mother prepare food on? Did you have a... She had a home comfort. It's a very nice stove. Did, did that burn coal? Uh, it burned coal on wood. But we used to use to put a, put a protection of the grate. Coal burned the grate out. We used wood because that was my job to cut wood. There was no problem at the time I was... Six, seven years old, I was starting to drop a bit axe and cut the wood. Uh, all right. Okay. So yeah. I, what uh, what kind of wood did you like to like to well, uh, split? Some was better than others. We, we we were hung up on very little pine, but oak was a good wood to cook with. It had uh, seasoning in it. Uh, you know, pine is something you might get the taste from it. That might spoil the taste somewhat. Uh -huh. But oak is the what you I primarily use. Did you and have it was easy to cut. Yeah. Did you have electricity? No, sir. Did you have electricity any time you lived there? Never. Didn't know what it was. How did you light the home? We used uh, kerosene. Uh, kerosene lanterns? Kerosene lanterns with the globe. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. That did uh, keep the lighting in the house. I had grandparents like that too. <laughs> uh, so, um, you, what year was it when you graduated? You were born in '23, so did you graduate in when 1930 something? Oh uh, yeah, that's uh, you know uh, that's something I never thought about too much. But I, I had to be. Uh, I think I was uh, say like. Uh, 13, maybe 12 or something, but not graduated. Okay. I wasn't very old. I, I can't remember exactly, but when I graduated my older, from my elementary school, I saw probably was about 12 years old. Okay. Now, uh, how did you, did you study by the light of your Yes, lanterns? yes, yes, I did. I had uh, very, A's and B's, I had all my, a micro, what you call uh, card? 
Your grade card was all A's and yes, B's. Yes, sir. A's and B's. I didn't have a C on the card. How did they light the schoolroom? Did that have uh, kerosene too, or did they have electricity? Well, we did the school today, not at night, so we never had too much lighting, but we did have a, a light there. It was uh, of the same type of light, okay. you know, globe, globe and kerosene and so forth, you know, in case they needed. All right. But school was for like uh, early at 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And we'd be out of school, so we probably didn't need uh, probably to didn't worry about the dark because it's always day, the daytime school. Uh huh. Um, what did you uh, use in the classroom? Did you have slate blackboards? Yes, we did have blackboards. Blackboards. Uh -huh. uh, I remember Channel Orange doing the arithmetic on the board. Good. Good. Birds, unique professor, good guy. What, what subject did you like? Were you pretty good in math? I liked uh, history and geography. Good. Well, they but, don't even uh, teach that anymore. I, uh, well, <laughs> and of course, uh, arithmetic uh -huh. was one of the studies that I did well in at, the point, at that point. Well, now, you told me that uh, after you graduated, you didn't go to high school. Why did you uh, not continue going to school? Well, times were so hard, like I, I mentioned before. That was a depression, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Sir. Well, so, uh, and so, uh, can I elaborate a little sure. bit? Sure. Uh, there was no meat nowhere. Meat was something that, of course, being on a farm like I was, was a good thing because we had chickens and different stuff like that, where we could season with chicken. We didn't even have hog meat, not to season, season everything with chicken. Chicken was dropped to the, the top shelf. All right. All right, sir. You had chicken and you had eggs from the chickens. And the eggs and the chicken. I had a hen house where the chickens lay eggs. It's just beautiful. And so there you are, eggs and chicken. Okay. That's diet, number one. And matter of fact, that's about uh -huh. all. Because uh, seldom ever they had any money. But we did have uh, beehives where we had bees, honeybees. Okay. And I would rob the bees by the time I was, uh, well, 13 to 14 years old. I'd go rob the bees, take the honeycomb out of the bees, blow the bees down, make them come out. Uh -huh. The honeybee, great bee. And I'd take a little honey out of there, and that was sweet. Sure. Chew it, chewing gum, the comb. Beautiful stuff. How many beehives did you have? We had about 14 hives of really? honeybees, and they swarm and light on the tree limbs with a beautiful apple tree. Two of them was there. And because the bees and cutting the bees off and putting them back into the herb and the habitat, honeybees killed all the apple trees by cutting the limbs off of them to a harbor, to a harbor, the honeybee. Okay. So did, did you uh, did you sell any of the honey to the neighbors? Sometimes or? the neighbor would come along and give a couple of dollars for a quart of honey. Okay, that was a blessing. How about eggs? Did you did you ever sell uh, sell no, eggs? No, didn't sell no eggs. Just honey. Okay. So uh, did you earn some money to help your mother out? Yes. What well, what did you do? I was a Strip tobacco, grade tobacco, five grades, six grades, any kind. I could read it, like you read your book. Okay. Uh, Plant and trash, red tobacco, lungs and bright tobacco. We separated off of the store. Okay. And I was a great higher grader, and people would come and get me because they knew I was good in tobacco <laughs> and grading it. And grading it. And did, you, it did you have to pick the tobacco too? Did you have to pick the tobacco? Yeah, we would raise tobacco. Except we had a tobacco base of 110 acres. Oh, wow. 
So wow. we had tobacco too. Wow. That was our Christmas deal. Okay. When we stripped tobacco and raised tobacco. Well, that's pretty hard on your hand. That's yeah. hard on your hands, isn't it? Oh yes, it is. It is. Well, now explain, explain to the people that might be watching this why, why that's so hard on your hands stripping tobacco. Oh, because I guess of the juice that comes from that back tobacco, primarily might be the reason why that uh, it would make your hands kind of very sore or something. Mm -hmm. It's probably the little juice that put off on that tobacco while you was pulling it from the stall. That's the only reason I can say that uh, but, but you had the damage would come from that. You had 110 acres of tobacco? 110 acres of tobacco. Well, yeah, who, uh, who helped you? Uh, uh, I mean, an uh, uh, acre and acre and one tenth. Oh. <laughs> what I oh, meant. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. If I, mean, <laughs> I anyway. thought 110 acres was pretty no, big tobacco. Uh, well, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> it's an acre and a tenth. Okay. An acre and a tenth tobacco base, which you call base, B A C. Right. right. Now we get that right. Did they plant it all the way to harvest? Did, did you guys, did you plant the tobacco? We raised, yeah, we... You, you planted you, it yourself? You have a warm bed mm -hmm. where you grow the little tobacco to make the plant for you can set it in the field. Okay. And you get it out of the warm bed like you do sweet potato plants and stuff like that. All right. a special bed for it. Did and you, you have a big... plants and you set them out in 18 inches apart. Mm -hmm. Fur and the fur. And it turns out so beautiful, fine tobacco. Did you have a vegetable garden also? Oh yes. Tomatoes. Tomatoes, and green beans, green peas, and also potatoes. Beautiful garden. Nothing like it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, how did you get into the military? Did you volunteer or were you drafted? No, I was drafted. And where where were you drafted from? Where did you report? From Dallas. I was drafted from Stanton. I was with my auntie at the time, who Aunt Mary, who lived in Stanton, Kentucky. That's deep east too. And I was drafted. I got this thing from 141 that I was to report to the board. 141, and that's what I did. When when, all, was, when was that? You got your notice. Do you remember the date? Oh, uh, yes, it's 1943. 1943 when I first went before the, the board. Okay, then. 1943. After you signed up, where did they send you? Well, I, got to, I got my papers, which is I have upstairs there, where they gave me uh, leadership. My first leadership training came from directing 30 people from Stanton, Kentucky to Fort Thomas, Kentucky. You went to Fort Thomas? Yes, sir. Okay. What did you do at Fort Thomas? When I got to Fort Thomas, I reported in and told the, the sergeant there that I had that I had 30 people that was okay. that I had uh, been, been in, so to speak, in charge of and showed him my, my papers that that I got from the board to give me the authority to do, and they were supposed to be obey me from the, on the bus all the way to Fort Thomas, Kentucky. Okay, so you got there by bus. Now, what kind of training did you have to go through at Fort Thomas? I didn't get much training at Fort Thomas. That's what always worried me about that Fort Thomas thing. We didn't do much of anything there. Where did you go? Well, time passed so fast. And first thing you know, I'm in South Africa, just like that. South Africa? South Africa. Now, Things well, begin to move. I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you nothing, just move you. Now, <coughs> you were drafted into the Army, and uh, I see here on your papers, you were in uh, 579th? Yeah, 179th Port Battalion. Okay. Port Battalion? Mm -hmm. All right. Where did you leave from the States to go to South Africa? Well, let's do the, let me back up a little bit here so I get this correct. I wound up in Newport News, Virginia, from Fort Thomas. Okay. 
When I got to Newport News, Virginia, they loaded me on the William H. Grimm's with a five, with a Liberty ship, not a transport, a Liberty. And on that trip, it was 19 days to South Africa, from Newport News, Virginia, to South Africa. I was on the boat for 19 days. How many? Uh, Atlantic Ocean on my way, didn't know where I was going, <laughs> wind up in South Africa. Well, how many uh, fellows were on board with you? There must have been 500 of us. No. At least 500. And this was in uh, 1943? 1943. 43? 1943. Now, in, in 43, did you have any, did you go over there in a convoy or were you by yourself? Did you have other ships with you? The other ships was escort. We had uh, all kinds of PT boats and stuff that followed, escorting us, of course. You had destroyers? We had a mishap where they came to surface and you could hear them hollering going on, squealing going on. They come on, but what happened, one of the other ships had hit us. That what, made a mistake was a collision? some kind of way and hit us. Okay. And so uh, those uh, PT boats and whatever the government used like uh, the police department and, and used their vehicles and things. This thing was whistling and crying and hollering going on, shaking us around to a couple of them, you know. So well, I didn't know what was going on. So, then. so was your- There was something that never come to me anyway. But your ship wasn't damaged so much that you couldn't continue? No, they did the, the number on it and then got it all together so quick, make your head spin. And so we off to, to all, all the ship didn't have anything to do with curtailing our speed. We are doing about 35 knots all the way into South, South Africa. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, did you have any threats of any German submarines while you were on that trip? No, sir. We didn't have an uh, encounter with the, our enemy at that point. Okay. Where did you land in South Africa? Uh, Oran. Oran? O Oran. We okay. landed in Oran, Africa. Casablanca right. was just down the road a piece. But uh, still Africa. So when you, when you landed, well, l let me talk about the, the uh, trip over there. What kind of uh, sleeping accommodations did you have on board ship? Well, it's just bunks, you know, a little bread, just bread pulling out from the wall, and a little blanket and pillar and stuff. Slip on. How, how many bunks were on top of each other? Uh, well, you know, in those hatches, five hatches on a Liberty ship. Okay. If you understand what I'm saying. Those are hatches that you put stuff in. Yep. Okay. Well, yeah, they were full of men instead of anything else. Right. And uh, so I guess uh, maybe if I, I'd have to estimate there might have been 20, 25, or 30 people maybe in hatch Each number hatch? two where I was. Okay. Because this is the largest hatch on the ship. How was the food on board ship? Very bad. <laughs> what kind of food did you get? I think it was horse meat. <laughs> it wasn't like mom made. <laughs> I know they gave us hot chocolate, and that's the worst thing, but they made a lot of guys sick. They got seasick. How was, how was the trip over? Did you run into any high seas or bad weather? Well, the weather was pretty bad once, and, and swept across the deck, and they cleared the deck, cleared the deck, and the water got all over top of the deck. Okay. Uh-huh. And that was kind of weird and scary. I'll bet it was. Yeah, because, uh, you know, the, that water come across that ship deck, but that ship subdued that condition. It's amazing, amazing. Had you ever been on water before? Oh, yes, I'd been trying to swim and different things in the water. Water was part of my life. Okay. Water was, oh, we were all go swimming in, in the water a lot, because water was, just a natural thing. Well, bef before you uh, were drafted, had you ever been out of Kentucky? You know, uh, no one in the rest of that was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that's everything. No, is I never had been out of Kentucky, state of Kentucky. Everything was a. Yes, I was out of the state of Kentucky when I was born. Let me back up here. I was out of the state of Kentucky because I was in the 3C camp. 
before I served, before I went into the Army in Portland, Indiana. Okay. All right. See, I served six and a half months in Portland, Indiana in the Boys Camp, Conservation Corporation. What, what did you uh, do? Roosevelt started that. Right. What did you do for the uh, three C's? I planted trees, built banks, and did all the necessary surgery for conservation. Yeah. Anything that came to conservation, I did it. Well, good. And you did that about Plant six trees. My, my, my main, my main uh, thing that I did was planting trees, but I did a lot of sloping and draining off farmland. Uh, uh, that's what we did. Okay. We, that's the way to conservate the three C's. And you did that? in Concentration Corporation. You did that about six months? I did that six and a half, about six and a half months. What kind, of, what kind of accommodations did you have to sleep in? Well, that was another bunk thing. It's like we call bunks and yep. pot belly stoves and right. stuff like that. That was, came for me with the pot belly stove because <laughs> we had two in every barrack. <laughs> Two in this end, one in this end, one in this end on 15, 20 barracks where they had all these boys coming from all parts of the country at the three seas. Sure. Uh, Roosevelt was a wonderful uh, president. Well, let me ask you how the food was at the three C camp. Uh, it was eatable. Uh, it was uh, ration stuff. Okay. Was that better? But I didn't know they were going to feed me that all during my army career. But whatever I got in at the uh, in the conservation thing, I got it also all through my arm, my arm, <laughs> army life. <laughs> um, Potatoes and horse meat. Well, when, when you were <laughs> when you were at the three C camp, uh, how many hours a day would you work? We worked uh, like eight, about eight hours, I guess. Okay. And uh, did did you have some kind of a gang boss or? Yes, we call him a foreman. Foreman, okay. Doctor Sullivan, um, uh, Mr. Sullivan was a, was a trainer, fine really? man, fine man who uh, 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 took care of us. Uh, he. Uh, can I say this? Sure. He told me, he says, you uh, the pretty, he said, you do some mighty good work. He says, well, I'm going to send you to school to be a mechanic. I said, you want to do what? He said, well, I got the, the trainers down there, and we got school down there, and we're going to send you to school for me to be a mechanic. You, 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 you do well. So I did. I, I went to school down there to be a mechanic. Okay. There were other young fellas there and I never forget the guy who we worked together on it. It was a 36 Ford truck and we were to take out the transmission first of all and put in another transmission and that's what we did. Okay. So I tampered around with, with that type of work for say like uh, four or five weeks or something and I told uh, the uh, Mr. Sullivan, my foreman, that I wasn't very interested in it. I don't think I'd want to be back there. There's too, <laughs> too much reason. And you want to be outside I, planting and, trees. Yeah, I just want to blankly told you. Because I, <laughs> I was a former kind of fellow in it way, and I'm very independent, I guess you might say. But I'd eat them chickens and stuff for folks didn't have chicken. So that made me a little independent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, we, we've got you through uh, 3C camp, and now we got you over, and uh, you landed in Oran. Now, tell yes, me, sir. Oran, Africa. Tell me about uh, what, what you did over uh, over in Africa. You know, uh, you you you're, you're so beautiful. You ask good questions. You know, when I got there, and I saw these Arabs, and there's uh, such older. And then they had music heel there. Uh, can I elaborate? Sir? Sure. They had music heel there where the prisoners and the bad guys were all up there on that hill. And where the way they punished them, they had the beating of the drum, and they were out in the rain walking in the beating of the drum. I didn't see nobody beating those drums, but I hear it. 
Uh, that was a punishment for those guys, deserters and oh. just from criminals. Okay. And that's the way Uncle Sam punished. So that that was that, that was that our, was right there in in Oran. That was our own allies. That wasn't the the enemy. No, they were American people. It yeah. just wasn't was the conscientious objectors and so forth and so on. Uh, and also, uh, the sheep and goats, they slept in the same tent with the people there. I saw that. I didn't like what I saw. <laughs> and the odor was terrible. Now, Casablanca was off limits completely because of venereal disease and stuff like that. Okay. You catch you down there, like the, some of them guys at Music Hill was caught down there, and that's why they was punishing. That's why they were up the on the To that drum beat. That's why they were up on the hill. Huh? They were up on the hill because they'd been in Casablanca. <laughs> that's exactly. Because that was deadly. Like I said, they didn't want you down there, and they better not catch you down there. All right. So much for that. Um, what kind of accommodations did you have there? Were you sleeping in tents? Yes, sir. Uh, good question. I want to go back there. They told us that now, I want to, the sergeant told us. He said, now you dig in. Uh, first time I dug a trench hole. That's what you call it. Okay. I dug it and got in it. And that's what he said we wanted to do, and that's what I did. Ah. I had no choice. But obedience, I knew, was one of my leading things. I never had no trouble being obedient. So I dug a fine hole and got in it. Right? Uh, and how long did you, uh, was that your place where you stayed all the time except when you were out on duty? That's right, in that trench. <laughs> wow. A couple of days, sir. Okay. That I slept in that trunk at night. Okay. Then what did you graduate to? Did you get into a tent? A tent? Yeah, after, no. after the trench? I have, no, uh, that trench was about all I had. We didn't have no tent or anything. I wondered about that. I believe. What were your daily duties there? Didn't do much of anything uh, while we was there. Very peculiar. Uh, while we was there in Oran, we didn't do much of anything, but it would look like it was something that they just wanted us to experience, particularly Music Hill. All right. Uh, it looked like everything, uh, uh, the Music Hill thing was about the only thing there was dreadful to all see right. those guys walking and that drum beat all the time. So I never could understand what the purpose was of being in South Africa in the first place. Well, where did you go from there? That's a good question, sir. Well, they load us on a cattle train, just like cattle. Yeah. And that was the most stinking train you ever seen because <laughs> that's what they carried, goats and sheep and stuff on that train. And we were laying around on the train. Uh, I, I, I remember there must have been 25 of us in that car, in that section of that car. The section of the, of the train? Yes, sir. Well, you know, that's a, that was a mystery to me. I don't know where we wound up in New Guinea or where we were. But I remember the first time I saw Red Cross when we got off the train, got off that train. They got a Red Cross. Now, I've heard of Red Cross, but I've never seen it. And they were there to give us donuts and coffee, waiting on us. They knew it was coming. So we got off the train and the ladies and things, come on and get your donuts, come on and get your coffee and donuts. And I believe that was in New Guinea where we were. Uh, uh, it, it was very confusing, very confusing how Cassell moved me around like that. And I didn't know where I was going or where I was when I got off the train. Well now, you were you were in you were in Africa, Iran, and then they sent you to New Guinea right off. Yeah, seemed well, like that's the, the way it was. Well now, New Guinea is over by uh, Australia. It's somewhere like that. Where well, it you, is. You had that to cross. Like me, that's where it was. You had to cross water. How did you get across? Well, it had a tug thing, and, and you know, I crossed the equator too before it got where all was going. You know, uh, yeah. yeah, okay. They had a tug, 
a tugboat to pull us through the channel. Okay. okay. Yeah, because the current, the boat can't come through by itself. And it's on a track, like a train, but it's a tug. Pulled us through there, and about 20, 10, 12 days later, we crossed the equator. And I was initiated before I got whatever I was, before I have New Guinea or whatever it was. You know, you have initiated when you cross the equator. So what, what did they Initiation. do? Initiation. What did they do? Well, uh, they didn't do much to me, but the, the, the sailor was getting ready to do, because it's a code, it's the words, they ask you a word, you say the wrong thing, they duck you down. But I said the right thing, so he let me come back up. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it, was a, it was a weird experience. Uh, what, what kind of a ship were you on at that time? I, I was on another one of them Liberty ships. Another ship. Liberty ship? No, another Liberty ship. Five hatches. Now, but it, it moved 35 knots. It's like holy. Now, did you travel through the Suez Canal? Yes, yeah, Suez Canal. Exactly. Okay. That's what it was. Okay. And uh, hmm. so, how many, how many days you said it took? Uh, 12 or 13 days or 17 days? Uh, the, well, I don't really know exactly how, how many days it was when we got the, when we crossed the equator and so forth and all that stuff. Okay. All right. But uh, it was, uh, it was an uh, aggravating experience. Aggravating experience. All that old ship. Cattle train, stinking stuff is that very difficult, uh, very difficult. That's a, that was a part of my career, my army career, that I didn't lack. <laughs> well, we're going to jump around a little bit here because on your paper uh, it says that you were in Naples, Italy? Yes, sir. When were you in Naples? Now, after all the shenanigans and moving around, some way or another I wound up in, in Naples. And that was real dangerous. Why is that? Because Jerry was bumming every night in where we were. And I remember running out of the shelter about Trump to drop the third night, going out on long underwear. And got time put on nothing else. Jerry was dropping bombs everywhere. We were running to every shelter and we got in there this people this pool. Well, maybe ten, twelve people was already in there uh -huh. in the shelter. And uh, that went on, uh, by the way, that went on for maybe, I don't know, two or three months that I'm running from Jerry. Jerry's bumming, I'm running. Jerry is the German. That's right. So what were your duties when you were there in Italy? What did you do? Well, I finally got the assignment and got around to where somebody would talk to me. And that was a good thing. And I got to be assigned to the hatch tender job. They picked me to do the hatch tender. The hatch tender? Hatch tender. On board ship? On board ship. So were you in port at that yeah, time? In port. So uh, yeah, there's a note here, Arno. Do you remember being in Arno, Italy? Arno, A-R-N-O? No, uh, I was in Levon. But I spent Levon, Italy, which is in the northern part of Italy, for for a couple of months. But my main time spent in Italy was in Naples, Naples, Italy. Yep. Yeah. How about Rome? Did you get to Rome? Oh yeah, I went to Rome. I went to Rome, but I didn't have permission to go to Rome. But I went to Rome. Went to Rome twice. Well, while, tell me while about, I was in Fort Clark, Texas. Tell, tell me about going to Rome when you weren't supposed to. <laughs> that was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made. And, and, and because I was led by a three-striped sergeant, which would have been in a lot of trouble if he'd have found out that he took me to Rome. But anyway, he was driving a six, uh, 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 what's it called, the, the six by six. Okay, truck? Yes, yeah, sir. truck. It's a truck, six by six. Yeah. We, call we call them a six by six. It's a number of truck. So he uh, he asked me to go with him, and I just got in there and went with him. So we wound up on the Rome and different places, uh, and I never knew why he was there, why he wanted to go, want me to go to Rome. 
Was this a white guy or is this another no, uh, African American? He was a black guy, but he had, he was a sergeant. Okay. And why he was there, he wanted to go up on Via Roma, which is the main street, and get some eggs. And so I went with him up there, and <laughs> by George, they didn't have no grease and nothing in Rome. There wasn't no hogs and nothing. They didn't have no meat. And oh, guess yeah. what? They cooked the eggs in mutton tallow. Oh. And you had to hold your nose to oh. eat Oh, gee. <laughs> Stinking. So what, what, uh, <laughs> Uh, what rank were you at that time? What was your? I rank? didn't get my stripes until uh, uh, I guess I'd worked seven, eight months before I got to be a T five. Okay. Technician, fifth grade. Okay. Uh, hey, that you know what that represents, te te technician, fifth grade. Well, go ahead and t go ahead and tell us. Well, it's two stripes, two stripes down and a T. Now, if I take the T out, I'm a corporal. Okay. But with the T, I'm a technician. <laughs> Fifth grade. <laughs> Fifth grade, okay. <laughs> so, uh, did, did you spend a lot of your time on board ship or did you spend a lot of time? I spent on... all my time on board ship. Even though you're in the Army, you're on board ship? Yeah, I'm on board ship. Were you, now you've told me about uh, Jerry doing frequent bombing. Were, were you ever in fear of your life? Yes, sir. That? That's where I got two bronze stars. Well, tell Christ me about that. Was, you tell me about that. You want to talk, you want me to tell sure. you about that? One of the Andrew Beachhead thing where we went and I'm a tender. I'm in charge, so to speak with my teeth. Uh, we unload, we had a load of stuff and I didn't have no idea what we was carrying. We had ammunition to carry to the line. We was loaded with all kinds of 500 pound bombs and different stuff. And we had Anzo Beachhead and Jerry must know he's coming. This is Anzio? Anzo Beachhead. Anzio. Anzio. That was terrible. Yes, sir. Now, what were you in? Were you in a truck? No, I was on the boat. You're on the ship, boat. On the ship again. And Jerry bombed so close to us that the ship was rocked when he dropped. And I knew it was going at that time. And guys was praying and hollering and going, I'm scared to death. So I had to kind of try to control the, the, some of the guys. Well, I thought I was in charge anyway, but I guess I was. So it calmed them down a little bit because the fear was got, got into the thing and that's dangerous. Sure. Fear. So I knew what I had to do, so I calmed them down. Some of the people who that used bad language and talking about this and that, you thought they were bad guys, they the first ones start crying and hollering. I told the guys, I said, now see what the example is, you don't want to fall in that like that. You got these guys running around here talking about they're bad. See how they took to the, they couldn't take the heat. That's so what I, I did, sir. So how'd you get them calmed down? Calm down. Yes, sir. So I got them calmed down a little bit. But uh, Jerry stayed there at least 45 minutes. It looked like a setup. And he was after us, but he missed us. And another time, same thing happened once before. Uh, so I got two bronze stars. Okay. All right. Because Jerry just wanted to bomb us, just wanted to kill us. Well, I, from what I've read, Anzio was really a terrible battle. That's where I was, terrible sir. Terrible battle. Was Anzio Beachhead. That's where I got my first star, my first well, while you bronze were, star. While you were uh, in port there at Anzio, did they bring any uh, wounded or, or dead soldiers out to your they ship? They brought the several soldiers to our ship. We, that, that's a good question, sir. So there must have been 25 or 30 guys that we brought back to Naples with us when they left the, be the beachhead. Okay. These, are, the these are wounded guys. Yes, sir. Did you have a medic on board ship or anything? They must have been. Uh, I don't, I'm not, not sure about that. I wouldn't want to answer something I don't know what I'm talking about. They had to be medics, those people, the medical professionals sure. to take care of them. 
because some of those guys were badly battered, battered. I think Jerry must have hit that ship or something because we bought 25 or more back. Okay. Yes, we did. Even though your ship wasn't hit, no, my wasn't did hit. Did you see other ships get hit by bombs? No, okay. it was it was late dark. It was dark, and uh, I didn't see any other ship hit. But I just assumed that they must have destroyed one or two of those ships because these guys did, was one who said was escaped. Uh huh. And I, I surely that some of those folks maybe got blown up because they was continuing dropping. Now, he wasn't playing. Were those 25 fellows, were they Army or Navy or Army, Marines? Army, Army. Army? Most of all of them was Army. They didn't have no Navy guys in, in that group at all. Okay. Uh, let's, let's take a break. Now, uh, Marion, uh, I've, I've got your DD-214, and your DD-214 says you're in Rome, Arno, and the Northern Apennines uh, over in Europe. Mm -hmm. They're probably right about that. And then on your uh, separation, they talk about you, they don't say anything about you being in Africa or Italy. They just say you were in the Southwest Pacific for mm -hmm. two years. That's the way they did it, and that's what they made up. That's one thing I never could understand. Well, it, but they didn't seem to care much about South Africa and why we were there. I never could understand that in the first place because it didn't do anything. All I had these guys there, prisoners there and everything, and then dug a hole and got in, slept in for two days before we got on that cattle train, which was nothing with goats and sheep and stuff been yeah. riding on it. Yeah. It stunk so bad it made you sick at the stomach. And that's where I lost control of things. So they, uh, un under your military Specialty, they've got you as a Hotch, H-O-T-C-H, tender. That's right. That's Two, a Hotch tender. 271. That's a Hotch tender. That means that yep. I took care of the hatch signal man. I did the signal work. I did the deliver of uh, different stuff. Uh, I had two winch operators sometime, but I know how to set, set the gym bowl boom and all that kind of stuff. Set the gym bowl boom. Yep. You know that big boom on there? Yeah. I had to know how to set that. And I had operators who, two winch operators, the ship cut two winches. Okay. To lift and swing that stuff around, sit on the bars, load on the truck. But whatever it needed to be done, that was my job. Okay. See that that done. See that that hatch was unloaded. Whatever it's kind of infancy or whatever kind of um, uh, material or whatever. It's, that was my job to unload it and put it on the bars. And those bombs, they had hooks on them where you hook them. 500 pound bomb, uh, the 105 millimeter, yeah. which is Uncle Sam was great. That's the great weapon, 105. 105 howitzer, yeah. Yeah, one of the bullet ends, where everybody want to lift the bullet in to run around and get the shell in. You could lift the shell in, but you couldn't lift the bullet in. <laughs> everybody knew. <laughs> you get somebody who knew they put that bullet in on you every time. Because that was the heavy end, that 105 millimeter fine gun. Well, yeah. let me ask you something that might be sensitive. Did you have any uh, problems with uh, racial discrimination when you were in service? Well, you take a fellow, uh, you could question. And I want to be honest and sincere because that is a hard question. Being raised in Kentucky, like I was, uh, you'd be surprised at how well we got along with people of all colors. You, you tell the camera that. <laughs> well, we got along. Uh, it was wonderful how, of uh, course, uh, I was segregated from schools. Don't get me wrong. There was a white school down the street there, just like our school. Okay. Uh, they were going to elementary at the same time I was, and we were walking distance about a half mile apart. Well, I didn't know that. But okay. that's all white. When it all over here <laughs> on the pumpy, it was all black. And we passed one another going home, white kids, and the black. But we had no problem. Got along. Uh, so, 
I guess what I want to end up with is that uh, when you ask the question about discrimination, uh, if it was a lot of discrimination, it didn't bother my family. We go to the store and get credit on us. We had credit at the store. Uh, what, what you call a, one of them stores got everything in it. The hardware store or <laughs> yeah. general store? General store. That's what I'm trying to look for. You go over there and get anything I wanted. And sometimes the guy would give me some candy or something, whatever it was. So, so it's just. Uh, it's hard to say, but you know, it got along well. So you had a, you had a. I, I, I remember the name of the people, a lot of white people who lived nearby, who were farming on hard times, just like where I was, trying to make ends meet every day, and going to school, and kids going to school, doing the best they can, horses and buggers and wagons and things are rolling. So I got along all right. So I can't be, uh, just can't say anything negative. So you you had a, you had already experienced a good relationship. Yes. When you were a kid, and that carried through to the that army. That carried over, <clears throat> shown up. The uh, and by the way, the the, the, the white girls uh, and all that kind of stuff, they were like they they called me by my nickname. What was your nickname? <clears throat> Skibo. What? Skibo. Skibo? S K W E B O. <laughs> my uncle gave me that nickname. So the, the, the girls would call me by my nickname. <laughs> White girls. Skibo, come here. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have an apple or something to give me or whatever they had. But they was always good. Elsie. Her name was, was Elsie. <laughs> but she was a lovely little girl. Uh huh. Uh, but that just goes to show you. Yeah. Everybody don't have a hard time being getting along with people. That's good. They have no problem there. And I'm not going to start it because we got along well. Good. So, um, where, where did you end up your your military career? Were you in uh, in Europe? I was in, in, I went on to Japan, to the Philippines. You went on to Japan? Oh, yes. <clears throat> I went on to the Philippines. I was in the Philippines. For two, a couple of weeks, getting my shots. I took four different shots, and while I was in the Philippines, getting ready to go into uh, Kure, Japan, where it showed up disease. Were you going to be part of the invasion? Or were no, you no, this is after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I mean, this is after bombing of Hiroshima uh, and okay. Ikasaki. After the bombing, after liberation, okay. we went in there to clean it up, to get things together. Yeah. And I wind up on the water again, on the ship, unloading and doing the same thing. In the morning I got up, the sergeant said, Corporal Miller, that's what he called me, Corporal Miller. He says, uh, you don't have to go out this morning unless you want to. I said, what makes it so different? He said, because you're going home. <laughs> that was, and the that USS was, Alpine was brought me all the way to Seattle, Washington, 17 days oh, wow. on the water. Well, and from, seven, from Seattle, Washington, to Camp Atterbury and Danner, where so Captain what, Wells signed my papers and told me goodbye. But he offered me a chance to stay because he said, you're a good soldier, Brother Miller, Sergeant Carpenter Miller, and I'm going to give you another stripe right now if you sign the papers to stay. We need you to train. And I took it and I looked at him and talked about him for a few minutes. And I said, sir, I really appreciate that. But I think I'm going home to take care of my mother. Well, you mentioned Pearl Harbor. Uh, where were you when the, the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor? Do you remember that? Yeah, that's a good question, sir. I. Uh, I had been in the three C camps and all that sort of thing, back on the farm and, and working wherever I could to make a couple of dollars for my mother. And uh, uh, what, where am I going with this? 
Well, how did you find out that they attacked Pearl Harbor? Did you hear on the radio or somebody tell you? Yeah, well, uh, it, it, <coughs> the news got out later on, I guess before, because Roosevelt declared a war on November, on December the 8th. Yeah. They burned Harbor on the Sunday morning, December the 7th, and he didn't declare a war until the next day, the 8th. So I, I, I uh, I'm, I'm going to flatten it out, tell you the truth. So I said, where in the world is Pearl Harbor? <laughs> and somebody said, you don't know where Pearl Harbor is? I said, no, I don't know where it's at. He it says, in Hawaii. So I found out before I left home, before I went to the board, that the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. I felt good about that, because I found out where yeah. Pearl Harbor was. Yeah. Well then, uh, you were going to go to J you were going to go to Japan uh, after the uh, after liberation after the bombs had been dropped. Yeah. How did you find out that we had bombed Japan with the atom bombs? I had uh, that uh, that uh, that was a uh, uh, that was known to through through the ranks of uh, my associates. Okay. They told me what it went on that uh, Harris Truman had dropped bomb on Japan, and it killed all the people in Japan. And it threatened to exterminate them if they didn't surrender. So uh, it was just good to, for the, uh, just like today, I just have good friends, people who could trust me and give me information and good stuff to help me, not to hurt me. You had to be pretty happy when you heard that Japan surrendered, didn't you? Yes, sir. I was very happy because I understood what my friends, my co-heads or whatever you call them, was going through. And my little experience with it, Jerry, were bummed all over me because I knew that uh, the Japanese would never surrender. You know, it was a gift to me for they told me, uh, some of my sergeants and people, around me who had rank, good rank, uh, just good people with a lot of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, it was just amazing. amazing. Uh, when, when the uh, officer told you you didn't have to go off ship that day, where were you located? I was in Korea, Japan then. By the, <coughs> by the way, uh, sir, Bodies are still popping up, you know. The first thing pops up from a, a body is the butt. That's the first thing pops up out the water. So it was still popping up oh. when I would go across the lake to get the ferry. Old man with the ferry. Of course, there wasn't no young man. All of them killed. Uh -huh. All the Japanese clean. Was, was bodies are no popping up. No young men. When I, when I got in Korea, Japan, I would find a young Japanese band, male nowhere, all women. And they were planting gardens and stuff. You know, they use their own manure to put on their gardens and stuff. No, I didn't know that. Yes, they do. And they, uh, they are wonderful hustlers. They know how to take care of business, Japanese. They put dried fish, fish up on top of the roof so it's dry out the sun to take it, take it off of there and do something to it. That's their dying with rice. Well, how long were you in Japan? I was in Japan six months. I don't know what they say about that, but I was in six months in Japan. Okay. And I was doing the same thing on the boat in Japan that I did everywhere else. When I got there, I did my, I was still assigned to uh, Pier 8, Pier, <coughs> I forget what, the, <coughs> I forget what, I think, Thank you, sir. Oh, uh, I did the same thing, and they had the same operation, unloading and unbarging, Lo <laughs> and doing the same thing that I ever did when I was in Naples, okay. when I got to Japan. And what I want to say to you, uh, the uh, submarines, mm -hmm. uh, in Korea, Japan, where I were, his submarines landed for like a mile almost looked like a mile. One man sub, two man sub, all kinds of subs was been captured by the United States Army 
and harbored there in Kyo, Japan. It's the most amazing thing you ever seen. Mm -hmm. Nobody want to mess around in America when it comes to war. Mm -hmm. They might do a lot of crazy stuff, but this day, America is undefeated. When they, when they want to be. When they want to be. When they want to be. They didn't do so well in Vietnam. Yeah. <laughs> they won the War of 1812. <laughs> Of all eight wars, the United States been been but eight wars listed. So the United States have been a captured of all wars. T tell me about these submarines, these one man one man submarines. One man sub. What were they made out of? Were they metal? Metal. And then, you know, we sold the Japanese. We we gave the Japanese. I sold the Japanese all our metal and stuff. And they 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 made uh, submarines out of it. Yeah. You remember that? Did you, did you ever have any threats from submarines while you were over in the Pacific? No. Did when you were when you were in Japan, in Curry there? Did you see any of the devastation that had taken place from the from the bombings? From the bombings, no. Okay. They kept that away from us. They didn't want to. That was the the more thing, and they, they wouldn't allow us to see that because. Matter of fact, uh, we don't know what shape you're in. First, it's uh, the mind and this terrible thing to waste. Might I be able to handle it if we'd known what yeah. going on? Uh, did you get off? Did, did you ever have any communications with any of the Japanese people while you were there? Oh, yeah, I talked a lot to the Japanese ladies, girls, and stuff while I was there. Uh, they are so kind. Well, how did you communicate with them? I uh, you didn't know. learn a little Japanese here and okay. there, just enough to the Watakushi wa na ta o wa masu komi maho memsa. That's Dutch, but the Japanese is a few things in Japanese I learned how to say. Good morning, good evening, I love you, Stan. A few things, and I got along. Pretty well with that. Good. And of course, uh, learn how to speak a little uh, Italian enough to. If I had the Italian, a lot of times I had to get some Italians to help me unload the ship because it'd be loaded with so much stuff. Uh, they allowed me to get a few Italians to help me to do things. All right. It, 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 it just worked out so well. Out of all the bad times, you know, the, the good times outnumbered the bad. So we usually forget about all the bad stuff because a little good stuff will stop the bad stuff. Well, what? Go ahead and have a drink. What What do you think was, uh, thinking back on your experiences, what do you think was uh, uh, probably the worst experience you had uh, in, in the Army? I guess the worst experience I had when the Danzo Beach had to, to deal there. I had been running to the airway shelter in my long in my long underwear, maybe two or three times. But it always get a warning the wheels blow they blow that horn, what you call let you know Jerry's coming. Sometimes you just have to put your clothes on. But, but I guess that's about the worst thing could ever happen to yeah. me, but uh, when because I, I really began to, to kind of give up a little bit because I thought that was the end because it looked like they just knew where we were. <laughs> you thought it was curtains for you, yeah, huh? Yes, I thought it was curtains. That's, that was a hard heart. That was a hard heart. Uh, and the old man of sad that gave me the will to not show fear to fight my way out. I did a lot of boxing and doing everything to learn to take care of myself. Well, tell me, for. tell me about your boxing. Well, I always wanted to be like Sugar Ray Robinson. I, uh, I wanted to box. I wanted to do things. I wanted, to, I wanted to be able to protect myself. Well, where did you learn that? Well, I guess <laughs> when I was in the Three Cs. First, starting off in the Three Cs. By the time I got. To the army, well, you know, we had the boxing ring, boxing gloves. Not challenge the guy to come on. So you got to, you got to show me what you know, man. Come on, put them, put them boxing gloves on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Just stuff like that. I enjoyed that. Well, did you have any boxing matches where people were betting on you? Oh no, no, 
I wouldn't like that. It's, Good. Good. It's more like self-defense and things like that. If a guy got out of hand or well, something like that, I'd invite him into the ring. It didn't always work out. A lot of times, guy beat me up, but I had the nerve to invite him anyway. <laughs> well, now, you, you know, you, you told me some things here. We just kind of stumbled on. We stumbled onto your uh, liking to to box, and we stumbled onto your your picking tobacco and being a able to grade the, the tobacco leaves. What, what other uh, hidden talents do you have that you haven't told me about? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, uh, but I, uh, I've tried to entertain people uh, one way or another all my life. Uh, I play ping pong, try to play golf, you can see the cup. Bowl. Okay. All right. Bowl. Bowl. Yeah. Uh, I've tried a whole lot of stuff. Okay. Uh, well, but <laughs> jack of all trades, good at none, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've heard of that. <laughs> um, let, let's let's go back to Japan and uh, what's the ship that you came home on? USS Alpine. And you landed where? In Seattle, Washington. Seattle, Washington. It rained all the time we were there. And the kind of ship you came back on, was that a troop ship? or was No, that, that, was, that was one of the greatest ships. It was a trans, it was a transport. Okay. A fine ship. USS Alpine. How was the food on board ship there? Here's a little better. It did give us some, uh, <coughs> I forget what the, what the diet was, what the dining was. But it was pretty good. It was better than I've been at on, on the U.S. Alpine. But <laughs> they're getting rid of us now. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> We're on our way to Seattle, getting out of the Army, so they're going to try to sweeten us up so we re sign up again. They have to sign up, re-sign up to do another adventure. How was your accommodations on board ship coming home? Oh, fine. How was, it, how was the cards? Did we played you, cards and laughed and throw jokes and all the way back. Did you have to any Dakota and South Dakota and North Dakota? As we left Seattle on the way to Camp Annabury and that. When you're coming back from Japan, did you have any bad weather, bad seas, typhoons, or anything? No, well, it's a smooth sail. We didn't have no mishaps like we did going like that uh, incident we had going over. Okay where we had bumped the ship, but bumped us. We didn't know what was going on, but we knew there was trouble in the water yeah. because of those PT boats and things, how they make that sound. Yep. Beautiful things you ever seen. They be moving. <laughs> Ooh, they be moving. Them things be moving. So how did you get to Camp Atterbury? By train, plane, bus? Train. Train. After we got there, that's how you go again. We had to load it on this train, but it was decent. <laughs> Better than the cattle car. It wasn't <laughs> stinking. <laughs> How many day trip was that? That was a long trip. Uh, Three or four days? Yes, sir. It's a good question. I think it was exactly four days. Okay. Four days in Seattle to Camp Atterbury, to, uh, um, Camp Atterbury in Diana to North Dakota and South. I may remember when they told us to put a train stop for us to get donuts and coffee again. And if you spectorate, it's freeze before it hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> it was cold in South Dakota. Uh, Ooh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So w when you got to Atterbury, is that where they offered you? That's where Captain Wells <laughs> took over and tried to ask me to sign the papers, and he was going to make me a sergeant right then. He said, you're going to be a sergeant right now. Just go ahead and sign the paper right there. And you need you. He, first of all, he said, we need you. You, 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 you. But one of the good things about that, how he put the butter on it, he told me, you was a good soldier. He told me that. He said, you are a good soldier. We need you. Sign right there and I'll make you a sergeant. <laughs> but your mother needed you more than the Uncle Sam. Yeah, I was concerned about her. Yeah. Well, well how, did you, how did you get home from Camp Atterbury? Oh, 
I was, uh, you know, that's the, you know, I, you know, that's folky. But if I remember, they had a special thing for me that brought me to Winchester, Kentucky. Okay. Because that's why I asked to be brought from Camp Atterbury. Okay. And they had a, a special, special, uh, what is it, boss or whatever it was to bring me to, to Winchester, Kentucky. Because I didn't pay nobody to bring me nowhere. So from Winchester, how did you get home to mom? I don't know how I got home, but I don't remember how I got home. Did you home. hitchhike or? Oh, uh, uh, no, no. Uh, I don't know if one of my cousins took me uh, to Clay City or how I got there, you know. I just don't remember. Something foggy about that. But uh, when I left uh, Camp Atterbury, they had transportation for me. They brought me to Winchester, where I was to stop at. Because I had friends and relatives in there. And I knew if I went that far, it's because I wanted to get there. Because I knew a lot of people there. Because I had, I'd been offered to go to school there just to Oliver High. Uh, uh, Miss Gateward, she said, you gotta continue your education, you go to school. You say, you try it up and go to, go to Oliver High. That's a good school. Since you can't go to Tenney Hill, which is in Mount Sterling High School, so I had a choice to go to Tenney Hill or Oliver High. And now were those I was offered that. From, were those segregated? Oh, no, no. Uh, it was, uh, uh, these were both black schools. Black. Tenney Hill and Mount Sterling and Oliver High was all black. And they had the Professor Owens and Scott Mitchell and different teachers that was teaching there at Oliver High. Good teachers. I knew their, their background and I knew the family. Uh, but, uh, well, tell me, tell me about what your mother did when she saw you coming back from the Well, the, the tears came. And, <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, uh, she loved me naturally, and I loved her. And and whenever I got a, a couple of dollars, she was the first to get the big end. Uh huh. <laughs> now, when, when you got back home, did you uh, uh, did you look for work to get a job? Not right away. What did you do? Well, I loafed around and tried to get over your military experience. Tried to get over my military. Exactly that, sir. I guess that's a good way to put it. And I never thought much about work because. Then I had offered to be a truck driver, a different one of some friends of mine. And they drove a truck for 30 years. A lot of the guys were homes, and my first cousin was offered, and I was offered a job driving a, a 18 wheeler. They drove 18 wheeler, they didn't have no more experience than I did, and they taught them how to drive. And both of them drove for 30 years and made a retirement, Combs and Winford. And we laugh about that there in Winchester, Kentucky, how they made it. And they said, Mr. Miller, you went to the Army, you should have went to drive the truck. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they made it, and they, they, they were good drivers. Never had an accident, that's the beautiful thing. Little Combs wasn't nothing but a little fella, he was about five foot, six inches tall, but he could drive an 18-wheeler. Uh -huh. Yeah, he made it, made it. Now, what, He's a what good was kid, it? he's from Hazard, Kentucky. Now, what was his name? Combs, it's a Combs. Combs? Combs seal. seal. It Hazard, came from Hazard. All the Combs was born up in Hazard. Even one who got to be governor of Kentucky, he was from Hazard. Is that C-O-M-B-S? Yeah, C-O-M-B-S. What was his first name? I forget what his first name was, sir. <coughs> but uh, Wimper Smith, that, he was my uh, first cousin. He's one of the guys that took the truck driving job. He drove too a long time. Well, what was your first job when you got back? What'd you do? Yeah. I, uh, I didn't do, I didn't do no whole lot of work when I got, I got my, uh, mustard out pay. I got some other money that you know, Sam gave me. And I depended, I, 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 I used that uh, like a few. And then I decided, you know, as I remember, kind of foggy. I said, I'm going to Ohio. 
So I had an aunt who lived on 207 Norwood Avenue in Dayton, Ohio, right here in this town. And I said, uh, I called her. I called her, I ain't Celie. That's her name, Celie. So I called her and asked her, could I come and spend a little time with her till I got a job? She said, yes, you come on. I need somebody with me. I'm here by myself. 207 Norwood Avenue. 207 what? Norwood. Norwood, okay. Avenue, yeah. So I okay. left Winchester, Kentucky and came to Dayton, Ohio. How I've been here. How did you and get that here? was in 1947. How did you get here? Car? Was a train. Train? Uh, the L and N. Oh. <laughs> uh, yes. Yes, I did. Uh, yeah. That's what, right. What's the first car you ever had? It was a Chevy. 1941, made during the World War was a lemon. A 1941 was a gear ship on the stern wheel. Chevy. When did you buy that? I bought it from Walker Motor Sale, and then, then I went right back to Walker Motor Sale and traded in and got a Buick, and that was home free now. <laughs> I traded in, and because, uh, uh, well, I began to get to work, you know, and make a little money. So I had sense enough to know that I, the first thing you gotta do is get yourself a car. You know, you like to be able to help you. The first thing you do, you gotta move away from here. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so I got this Buick and then I, I got off to a pretty good start. Good. But I wanna tell you this joke about that. Streetcar was running then on the street. We had streetcars running up and down the street. Yep. And they had one on 5th Street that called come down from to what's called come downtown. Cost you a nickel to ride if you could find a nickel somewhere. Anyway, I had my car, uh, that Buick, and it was raining. And I'm out there showing off, speeding and going on, and I hit the streetcar. Oh. Right? And the heat car raised me, ricocheted me off instead of going in the river. Right there at the bridge, oh, right? Oh. I went down and hit the pump, the, the fuel pump, the filling station pump, where the gas was going to blow up the whole world. Now I done went in the Army all that and got out and going to blow up everybody <laughs> to hit that pump. And the pump was not when I knocked it off the foundation. Did it start a fire? No, no, it didn't have no fire, nothing. <laughs> oh. There's a word. There's a, there's a word thing, and I hit uh, hit that so the railroad tracks slick and raining. But I not experienced enough to know that that point because I I had had my uh, and the Helena was there where I got my driver my my driver's uh, examination. Helena Street. On Helena, that's where the highway patrol so had a headquarter on Helena, right off of uh, Kiwi out here. Yeah. Yeah, no, but I said, what did I make on my grade? He said, 98. I said, if I made 98, why didn't you give me 100? He said, we don't give 100. There you go, highway patrolman. I said, well, that's good. I'm glad to get away with the 98. <laughs> well, yeah, you kind of were, you able, a bit. were yeah. you able to drive that Buick anymore, or did you have to get another car? Oh, yeah, I got it fixed. It wasn't that hurt that much. It didn't knock the wheels out of it. Everything was just sliding back. <laughs> so it didn't do that much damage. So I believe the $147 was a whole lot of money then. Yeah, it was. That was in 1947. Yeah. Uh, but I'd been discharged on January the 22nd. Uh, uh, let me see. Let me get this right. I was just called uh, from Camp Atterbury on February, on December. Yeah, David Simmons, the 22nd. Uh, uh, so your, your date of induction was July... 1946. ...was July 2nd of 43, and... And our separation should be 22nd, 1946. Uh, well, I don't... Did you tell you? I don't see it right off here. Uh, January, the, January the 22nd, 1946. I was separated from Camp Atterbury, Indiana. Yeah, January 22, 46, you're right. You're right. Well, 
Did you have a girlfriend when you came up to Dayton, or did you get a girlfriend? <laughs> well, I just had them, I had them lined up. <laughs> All right. I had a car and a working. Yep. And the young girls, uh, you know, girls want to ride. They hadn't been riding because nobody would pick them up. Well, where but I you? got a car, and I just had a car loaded up. I just, I'd run over one or two to get the one I wanted, you know. <laughs> Well, now, <laughs> on your on your documents here, you you tell me that you worked at Dake MCAST? MCAST. MCAST Corporation for 32 and a half years. Was that your first job? That's my first job and last job. Yeah, you worked at 32 That was my first job and my last job, sir. 32 and a half years. Yes, sir. I worked 32 and a half years, and I I was all, uh, all, Everything fell in my direction. I get the job doing all machine work, reading scopes, doing Brunel, uh, in the quality control department, working uh, in the finish department. Uh, Brunel, is that a hardness test? Yes, it is. Okay. The hardness, softness of the gray arm. Reading through the scope. Set the scope. 207, read from the degree to the scope to give you the softness, the hardness of the casket. I got the job doing that. And I'm, uh, everything just... So when did you retire from there? I just retired from there. When? Uh, now you had 32 and a half years. Yeah, uh, I retired, uh, let me be precise. I retired on the uh, uh, September the 30th. I retired on September 30th, 1979. Okay. September the 30th, 1979, I threw my hat in. I had told my, I told Jerry Ank, Jerry Ank was a German, and I worked for him, he treated me good. I told him I was getting ready to leave in 30 days, I gave him 30 days notice. He said, oh, no, don't get you, don't. Stay up, stay, stay up, I said, well, I'll think about it, but I'm giving you a fair warning and I'm leaving. Because he's on the supervisor I had to, 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 to cater to. He was the one I worked for most of the time. What was his name? Jerry Ank. Ank? E-Y-I-N-K. Okay. Jerry Ank. And he was a German, and he, he me and him got along well. I did what he told me to do. He trained me to do all that stuff. I didn't know I had it, and I just do it. So I learned how to read that scope and all that kind of stuff, and I'm home free now. Did because you Because that was an important job. Did you marry any of these girls that you were driving around? Well, I don't know what you call that around. I guess I married one. <laughs> Peggy Gibson from Louisiana. Peggy Gibson, okay. How did you meet Peggy? I met Pe Peggy came here in 1948. From uh, She finished high school and she left home and caught the train, came here. And she was running around here loose. She hadn't had nothing. She was like me, poor. And I ran into her after a lot of other associates. <laughs> and she looked like she was a little different from what I'd been associated with. This time was moving pretty fast. Uh huh. And I told Peggy, I said, Peggy, I'm gonna marry you. She said, what'd you say? I said, I'm gonna marry you. Now this isn't happening the first time you met her. No, no, I'd been around with her for a couple. Okay. Like maybe a year. Okay. Before I told her that. Sure enough did. Poor, I got married. Well, when they, you told when you sold her that you were going to, I got a picture in there. Her picture's right there. What What did she say when you said you were going to marry her? Didn't she that, she just chuckled a little bit. She chuckled a little bit. She she didn't know nothing else to say. She didn't say a thing. She didn't say, "Well, I ain't going to marry you. I don't want to get married." She didn't say nothing like that. She didn't say anything. She just kind of chuckled. I said, "Well, I got the hook in her." She didn't say anything. And so, from there on, it was the going uphill. So you, <laughs> so, you, so you got married. Did you marry Peggy? Yeah, I married her. Did you marry her in church, or where did you get married? We got married. That's something. 
You ask the good question. We got married in Liberty, Indiana. Okay. Fast wedding. Okay. Justice of the peace. All right. You remember what date that was? No, it was 1952. I can give you the year. It was in 1952. We got married, and you know, two weeks later, her father died, and oh. I had to take her to the home of Louisiana oh. to the funeral. Oh, shoot. 31 W, two lane highway all the way. 31? Through Leland, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, Little Rock, Arkansas, and the home of Louisiana. <laughs> That's what you get when you marry Southern women. No. <laughs> what, what, what kind of a car did you have going all that way? That Buick. Had your Buick? Mm -hmm. That Buick. It, so did Bob Shannon fixed it for me and told me you were going anywhere in the world. You, you get out of here. I told him what I wanted to, where I wanted to go, and I wanted to work, work on it. So make sure it carried me and brought me. So, how long were you married? Ten years. And what happened? Did you divorce or she die or what? <laughs> it went to a divorce. Okay. Yeah. We, uh, did you guys things have start, things start falling apart? Did you have any children? No. And that was a problem, for, that was a big problem for her because she wanted children. And she told me, uh, can I say what I want to say? And she told me, she said, I want you to go to the doctor and get a sperm count. But here's the click. I didn't go to the doctor to get no sperm count because I, I didn't think about nothing like that. But she was mad three times, didn't have no baby with nobody. Oh, After she, she got rid of me. Oh. Wow. And she died at 51 years old. Oh, shoot. Poor wow. thing. So did you remarry? I married her mother. And w what was your Lisa. Second? See that little girl right there? I see, 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 see Lisa. <laughs> what, what the? There she is over there. <laughs> her mother. Oh. And. I uh, with her until she died. So when did she you? She was 85 years old when she died. Pardon? She was 85 years old. Good. She died January, January the 25th. What January. She died January the 25th. 19, 19 and, uh, was it 19? What was it, Lisa? 2000? 2016. Hmm? 2000? 2016, she passed mm -hmm. away? Mm -hmm. That's right, 2016. <laughs> what was her name? Emma Nancy Miller. Emma, Emma Nancy, she was a Moore. Emma, Emma Moore Miller. She was, well, she had a triple name. She was a Chase and then a Moore. Okay. She was a Moore, Chase, and a Miller. She married twice. Then you and uh, Emma married August the 4th of 1979? Yes, sir. Uh, I knew that because you wrote it down. Here. Yes, that's right. <laughs> well, I'll be done. So now you have uh, you have some stepchildren, Patricia McCullough, McClure, Patricia McClure, and Shirley Hill. Shirley Hill. And Lisa Tosin. <laughs> right there looking at you. Right here. And right here on, Johnny, the hand, on the handshaking side. And Johnny Chase, and he Johnny, passed away. Johnny, Johnny Chase, yes. He's passed away. He passed away at 60 years old in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, after you retired, what, what, what did you do to keep yourself busy? Did you volunteer any place, or, or did you have hobbies? That I just do. I just played golf and. Uh, Bowl, and those hobbies of mine. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't want to brag, but I did well at my choosing. Sure. So with bowling and everything, I kept pretty good average. I did wasn't the best, but I would. You know, if you make a mistake, I might beat you. Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, that's what I did. I, I like to play games. Where where did you and play? Right to this day, I still love anything that matches wit. I like to do it. Okay. I like to beat my opponent, <laughs> thinking physically uh, or any other kind of way. Now you you have a television. Yes, sir. 
Do you watch game shows and try to uh, guess what the answers are? Sometimes. Okay. I like to do the Wheel of Fortune and different things like that. Uh, my wife and I always watch Wheel of Fortune. Yeah. Uh, um, you do do you? Yeah. So, <laughs> do you st are, you, are you able to drive? Do you still drive? Oh yes. Oh yes, sir. And you. I get where I want to go, but I don't do no night driving. I don't have to. Right. Because I get the girls, if I want to go somewhere, they'll come get me. So, Lisa told me she lives in Springfield. Yeah, she lives in Springfield, right around the corner there. Well, Springfield's a little ways away. <laughs> I know where Springfield is. <laughs> it's not right around the corner. Where, where, where is, uh, oh shoot, I lost, <laughs> I lost my page here. Where, where does Patricia live? She lives in Columbus. In Dublin, Ohio. And how about Shirley? Where does Shirley live? Shirley lives in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, out there in Macon, Georgia. Make, uh, okay, Macon, I know, Georgia. I know where that is. Yeah. You been there? Yeah, I've been to Macon. Mm -hmm. yeah, That's where I, she lived. I was born in and Columbus. She loves it. She's going fine. I was born in Columbus. You were? Yeah. Well, bless your heart. Congratulations. And I, I interviewed a merchant mariner from World War II lived on the same street I lived in Columbus. Yeah. Could have knocked me over with a feather. <laughs> yeah. Knocked you over with a feather. <laughs> well, let, let, let me ask Lisa, do you have anything that you want uh, Marion to tell us about or any questions you have? No, I don't. Um, I've learned a lot more with having this interview. Um, he's a walk-in library, has a wealth of knowledge with everything that we do. Um, I recall, I think the most important thing I, I remember growing up with him is always that if I brought home a B, I had to have an A. <laughs> if I, um, and he always helped me with history and math. And when I was younger, especially about three, um, in third and fourth grade, I used to get my twos like T O T O O T W O confused, uh -huh. and I had to write a paper. And <laughs> when I brought the information home, I thought I was doing a good job of writing. And he said, "You got all these words all mixed up." And I said, "I do." He said, "Yeah." So I was using there, like there, T H E I R and T H E R E. I was confusing a lot of the different similarities of the same word, and um, he helped me write that paper over and I got an A on it. <laughs> and every time I needed help with my homework, I always went to him. Well, Very instrumental. Well, let me ask you, Marion, you only went to the eighth grade. How did you, how did you educate yourself so well? Reading, different books and stuff. I read a lot of books. I read books like uh, Bird My Heart and Wounded Knee, Boston Stangler, uh, uh, Colin Powell book, my, my, what you call it, Journey, and things like that. Okay. I, 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 I read a little bit here and there. And when you were in school, but, were uh, you, when you were in school, were you serious about learning? Well, I guess I did, but like I told you, I had all a A's and B's and no C's yeah. on my sport card. And I had those cards around, and my uh, mother, she let folks come and take everything, you know, all my credentials and my ribbons and stars and pictures of me, the Japanese girls, and all that stuff. She just let folks come and take all the rifles. Took all my Japanese rifles and swords and stuff that I brought home from Japan. But she couldn't, she didn't protect the stuff. She just let my cousins the one came and took all the stuff. Oh. Uh, but however, I just put that in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I, 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 I didn't, I didn't fuss. I didn't blame her for that. But she did the best she could. Now I have here on your uh, information that you got uh, E A M E theater ribbon with two bronze stars. You got the Asiatic Pacific theater ribbon. You got a World War II victory medal 
Is there anything I left out? Not a thing. You must have known I was coming. Ma Mary, do you have anything you <laughs> want to ask uh, Marion about? This is my it's my wife Mary is our camera person today. She helps me out with a lot yeah, of these beautiful. interviews. She's beautiful. She's beautiful. Thank you. I've loved talking to you about tobacco. Yes. Um, I've enjoyed. I'm a school teacher. Yeah. And I love. No reason you're seeing, concerned about tobacco. Seeing somebody who has made an advantage out of everything in their life. Mm -hmm. That competitive edge, but then picking up that knowledge and using it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Well, I don't have anything else, Barry, and thank you for this interview. And thank you for, you for your service, and it's been a pleasure yeah. meeting you and talking with you. Well, you have a keen mind. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> well, I know. You have a keen mind because well, you ask you. things that no one ever asked. Thank you. Right on time.